this is the third and the last aspect of um, electrochemistry there is a lot more to it but i'm not doing um, i'm not covering that in this portion over here okay because we haven't really quite talked about um, the electrochemical cells with different concentrations and so on and so forth but if i get time i will do it but anyhow in this little presentation uh, we'll talk about the practical applications of electrochemistry and really about batteries and electrolysis okay so this is going to go real fast um, this is something you've seen before we have electrochemical cells and there are two kinds of electrochemical cells that we talked about a galvanic cell and an electrolytic cell. Galvanic cell is spontaneous. Electrolytic cell is when it's something, a reaction is non-spontaneous. So this reaction here, or this uh, cell that you see here, this is a galvanic cell, and this is a spontaneous reaction that's going on. Electrolytic cell will be the non-spontaneous, which means you have to provide energy, which means you have to have a power supply, okay, for that. So um, these, again, this is um, all the information about galvanic cells, which we have covered in the previous topic. Okay, so galvanic cells have electrodes and then they have the solutions in them also. There is a salt bridge that is an important part. Um, then there's the ion migrations that are going on and that's what happens on the salt bridges. When you have the electrons going over through the electrical current, there's an imbalance of the ions and therefore uh, the ions will migrate for using the salt bridge okay so the anions migrate towards the anode and the cations towards the cathode to balance out the charges and then we talked about the cell potential the cell potential this is primarily for galvanic cells only which means that it's only for cells in which case um, you have spontaneous reactions so that's what you would have for any kind of a battery for electrolytic cells where you have to provide energy, you still have to calculate the electrode potential because at least that is the minimum amount of energy you will need for reaction to happen, okay? So um, the first portion of this uh, presentation is just about galvanic cells and batteries. So first of all, batteries, there are different kinds of batteries. All of them are going to be galvanic cells, however, uh, but you have to remember that uh, the batteries are also of different kinds. They're small, they're bigger ones, they have larger voltages, they're rechargeable. Um, all sorts of batteries are available now, okay? And there's still research going on in trying to make batteries better, more powerful, longer lasting, and also less hazardous, okay? Because even now you should recycle your batteries in a proper place rather than just throwing them in trash because of the elements that we have inside them, okay? So you just can't throw them in the trash. So you should recycle your batteries. But anyhow, so there's still a lot of research going on with batteries and then there um, so we're going to go over like I think three or four different kinds of batteries over here so there are dry cells batteries and they're alkaline batteries and usually they have no fluid component in fact uh, for most of the batteries that you deal with like in your watch on your cell phone um, on your remote control all of those those are all what we call dry cells because they have no solutions in them per se like there is a solution but not as in liquid form okay so which means that if there's a solution it's probably like a mush okay in there like a very thick uh, substance in there okay not really like uh, what you would see a solution in a bottle so um, anyhow this is a classic example of a battery okay that you have seen and so um, all the components are going to be there, which means that you would have the electrode there, you would have the anode and the cathode electrodes, you would have the salt bridge. All of those things are all going to be there, okay? So it's just a matter of how to put it together so that you have a nice little compact design, okay, for something that generates power. So in this case, which is a zinc battery, so it's a common, very common alkaline battery, you would have zinc, okay, which is going to be your um, anode that is giving electrons. And then the cathode is where you have the ammonium ions and the manganese, uh, which is MnO2, manganese dioxide, to accept the electrons over here. So this is the overall equation. I don't need you to memorize the equation or anything like that. I just want you to uh, try to understand what's going on in a battery, okay? That's all there is to it because we can have so many different kinds of equations. For different cells so um, anyhow so here we have uh, the zinc anode the cathode okay the cathode is a little bit weird because there is no 
straightforward cathode okay that you can see over here so the cathode which really is this uh, manganese dioxide that's the only solid possible that is actually embedded on the graphite okay so which is the graphite over here which is then coated with a layer of manganese dioxide and then you have the moist paste that is the solution okay where you have the zinc chloride and ammonium chloride these are the two solutions that are going to help you with the balancing of the um, anions and the cations and then of course we have the paper spacer which really is the salt bridge okay so everything is there the designing is just different that's all okay from what you're used to seeing in two beakers and electrodes and whatnot so that's what a battery would look like in general like if you were to slice um, a triple a battery or double a battery this is what it would look like the watch battery, okay, the watch battery is also kind of the similar thing. It's also dry, uh, but it has a little bit more of an aqueous phase, okay, to it. So here also we have the zinc and the manganese dioxide, okay, given right here. The separator here really is the, um, the salt bridge, okay, that we talk about. And then we have the anode and then the cathode, okay, where um, you have the MnO2 and all that. So it, it's all there. The designing is a little different that's all so here is the first battery that we saw here the dry cell this is a little bit nicer picture of um, of the battery but this is your typical double a triple a cell okay this is what it looks like and um, the, the equations here again the thing about these batteries okay they're very good they start working really really good but then of course they last maybe a year or two years depending on where you're using it and the frequency of use but um, typically they don't last very long and if you have noticed then um, after a while they will deteriorate okay and they deteriorate because of zinc chloride ammonium chloride that forms the white powder that actually comes out of the cell okay which means that you know corrosion is going on everything is going on um, and so that deteriorates the cell it kind of causes it to break apart and if you don't take care of it in time then your uh, whatever gadget that you have is also going to get destroyed which means that the place where you put your batteries to connect the to get the power will, will not work properly it has to be nice and clean so you can conduct electricity so that's the problem with some of these kind of cells is that they um they deteriorate okay which is why the research keeps going on and on but uh, this is a nicer picture than the first one that i showed you and then of course we have the lead batteries this is what you use in your cars okay all the time now of course everybody knows that the lead batteries are rechargeable because if you need a jump start you can get a jump start thank god for that okay because otherwise you'd have to literally tow your car so um, the lead battery this is actually a very toxic system because lead is very toxic on the other hand you also have uh, the lead cathodes which are immersed in sulfuric acid talk about uh, bad, bad, nasty stuff. Okay, so concentrated sulfuric acid. So the battery really, if you lift it, it's actually very heavy, and that's because of the lead. Okay, and the lead is a very heavy metal. So it's a very heavy uh, kind of a battery, and then of course you have the sulfuric acid, which doesn't make it easier. So don't drop it. Yes, don't drop it. Anyhow, the way it works is that you actually have six identical cells in series. It's not just one cell. It's you have the six cells that are actually joined together in order to give your um, car the power that it needs, okay, to keep running. So um, it's not just one cell, okay? Each of the cell delivers about two volts, which means if you have six, you're getting about 12 volts out of it. Um, and then, of course, the whole rechargeable thing about it is if you see the reactions that are going on over here, okay, where the anode is giving lead to give uh, lead sulfate and uh, two electrons, and then the reverse is where you have the cathode and the lead oxide, okay, so uh, accepting the electrons, excuse me. And so um, in this case, since we're talking about lead here, it's easy to actually reverse this reaction, but again, you need power, right, because the forward reactions are usually spontaneous but the reverse reaction then would be non-spontaneous and which is why you need another car to jump start your car or a power source to jump source to jump start your car so to reverse that okay but of course once the reaction has started it's going to keep going on because uh, it, it got started it needed that energy think of it as activation energy if you want to 
But anyhow, so that's the advantage of the lead batteries is they are reversible because you give it power supply and you can reverse the, ath the anode and the cathode, okay? And then once that happens, then your battery is charged again and we are back to running again. The lithium ion batteries, of course, these are the most common batteries now because um, they're very powerful. They provide a very good voltage, okay, 3.4 compared to the lead battery, which each cell gave you only 2 volts, and the AA, which gave you only like 1.5. So lithium battery is very good. And remember again, uh, lithium is a very, very good um, oxidizing agent, okay, and so um, it's, it's really excuse me, reducing agent. So it's really very, very um, good element to work with as far as, you know, working as an anode. So um, it's a very good battery, okay, in general. Lithium also is a very light metal, which makes it an advantage to work with. Unlike lead, you would not want to put lead in your watch battery, for example. Um, so lithium is really nice to work with in those cases. And then we did not do any calculations yet. Uh, maybe we will, I don't know, but anyhow, one mole of lithium, which is this many grams of lithium, will give one mole of electrons, okay? Because one mole of lithium will produce one mole of electrons. It's only monovalent iron. And one mole of electrons is 6.022 times 10 to the power of 23 electrons, which is a bucket load of electrons, okay? So maybe two buckets, three buckets, who knows? But anyhow, that's a lot of electrons, okay, that we're talking about. So your lithium battery, which may be very, very tiny, may have a very small amount of lithium. It's still giving you a bucket load of electrons. Okay, so they're really very good batteries, okay, to work with. So a lot of the computers, uh, electronic devices, they will actually have lithium ion batteries because you need them to work longer. And then, of course, there are the fuel cells. Fuel cells are really being researched on a lot because fuel cells... Uh, really work very efficiently. They give really good voltage. And then the other best part about them is they're totally non-toxic. Okay, you can take hydrogen and oxygen and produce water as a product. What better reaction could there be? Okay, so the only problem here is that both hydrogen and oxygen are combustible. Once that problem is solved, everything will be fine. However, the problem is getting solved and there are cars that run on fuel cells now. And of course, um, some of the spacecrafts and all those are all supported by fuel cells because they're really very good source of um, energy and very clean burning fuels, okay? And I don't mean burning as in burning per se, but uh, very clean sources of energy. So uh, this is what a cell would look like. And again, I don't need you to memorize this. It's just for your general knowledge so you can see how things work. And because both of these are gases, remember, you have to have electrodes. So you can either use platinum or here in this case, we're using nickel Okay, for the electrode part. But that is what a fuel cell would be. Um, and fuel cells run on water. Electrolysis. This is... Uh, the other part of the spontaneous reaction, which means this is the non-spontaneous reaction. So electrolysis is where you actually have to supply energy in order to drive a reaction, okay? Why would you do electrolysis, okay? I mean, if you're trying to produce energy, then batteries, like all those kind of other spontaneous reactions we were talking about were super. So why would you actually make an electrolytic cell? You would do electrolysis only when you need certain things. So for example, the production of sodium, okay, is like one of the biggest electrolysis process possible, okay, out there. But sodium actually is in group one, it would rather lose an electron than take an electron. Losing an electron for it is a lot easier, okay. So to give an electron, it is going to be, uh, excuse me, for sodium to accept an electron is going to be a non-spontaneous process, which is really what this system does, okay, what electrolysis does, it actually pushes the electrons into the sodium, okay, of the sodium ion to give sodium. And then in chloride ions, that's where it takes the electrons out of to give chlorine gas. So here are the reactions that actually occur. And this is what we have to do in order to produce sodium and chlorine gases. So sodium is, sol uh, is liquid uh, in this case, but um, you can or solidify it eventually. But this is what you get uh, from doing electrolysis of sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is 
the source for making sodium and chlorine gas. Okay, it's a huge, huge productions of um, of doing this kind of electrolysis. Of course, a very um, you have to do this very carefully. Okay, because <clears throat> sodium itself. Um, it's very, uh, it's highly reactive metal, okay? So as soon as it comes out, you really have to store it properly. <clears throat> um, otherwise, it'll start reacting all over again, okay? That is how good it is um, as a reducing agent. So um, you have to really work very <clears throat> efficiently with this. Other places where you would do electrolysis is when you have to coat something. So coating something means, for example, electroplating. So, uh, for example, when you do gold electroplating, then that actually requires a very specific layering of one metal over another. So, when you electroplate something, okay, you have to do it by electrolysis because um, that's the only way you can control how thick the layer is going to be. Okay, so electroplating is a very common thing that is done by electrolysis. Electrochemistry is really all around us. It really is a very, very important aspect of our life in general. And then, of course, who doesn't know about corrosion? Anybody living in the north, south, wherever it might be, corrosion is our normal way of life that we've gotten used to. Um, corrosion generally is referred to as deterioration of a metal. Okay, The deterioration happens by an electrochemical process, and that is what is referred to as corrosion. People use the word corrosion as anything, but really the way it's coming from is it is an electrochemical process. Otherwise, you can say anything is getting corroded, but not everything is getting corroded. Everything can be deteriorated, but corrosion is very specifically an electrochemical process, okay? And so, of course, the metals that we know that undergo corrosion very easily are iron and aluminum. Aluminum, even as, um, as aluminum foil, aluminum containers, pots and pans, whatever, they also all undergo oxidations all the time, okay? And that's a corrosion. That's a process that occurs all the time. You really cannot do anything about it because those are Yep, spontaneous processes, okay? And so you cannot do anything about that. So uh, here is uh, an example of how uh, corrosion actually takes place. This is the whole chemistry in itself. If you think about it, we use iron a lot, okay? Whether it is in cooking or whether it is in making cars or uh, a lot of our metal things are made up of iron. Iron is a very cheap metal, so is aluminum for that matter. So it's really important to protect all these things. And that is why there's a lot of research done on corrosions to figure out what's really is working on and how do you protect uh, all these metals from getting corroded. So rust is what is produced as a result of corrosion. So you start with something that is iron and iron is the cathode over here. And then iron will give electrons to become iron two plus and that is what we call rust. The iron two plus combines with the oxygen to give iron oxide and that is that brown color that you see. The brown color is actually coming from iron two plus. Okay, it's a transition metals and it gives color. And so that's the color that you see from uh, rusting. All of this reaction is really promoted if you have water in there, because remember water provides the salt bridge then. So as soon as you have water, you have the capability now of transporting ions. If water was not there, there was no way of transporting ions, which means your iron is safe. But a lot of the corrosion that actually happens is places where there is high humidity. And so this is what happens in humidity. You're providing a nice salt bridge for the reactions to happen which means you're really providing a catalyst okay, for, uh, for the reaction to happen. The other thing is that in some cases, you may also have a little bit of acid okay, in this water. How would you guess acids? Well, we get acids because we have um, a lot of acidic gases in the atmosphere like carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and all of these are coming from exhaust fumes or from industries, okay, which are producing a lot of carbon dioxide and sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides. So all of those, they will mix with the water to give you dilute acids like sulfuric acids, nitric acids, carbonic acids, all of those acids are present. So once you have a water drop that is not just a water drop, it's actually an ionic substance there 
now you're really talking about a good salt bridge okay so which means you're really talking about a very nice cell that you have just created okay to corrode the iron so to protect your iron from corroding obviously you need moisture free conditions and of course no acids please okay so that's what uh, can prevent corrosion but of course to find those atmospheric conditions is very hard which means that chemist will actually have to work on preventing corrosion rather than changing the atmosphere which is really very hard to do well you can you can reduce carbon dioxide and the other oxides in the atmosphere so how do you prevent corrosion uh, the most common way to prevent corrosion is what we call passivation and passivation is when you actually put a very thin layer of another oxide and this is kind of like the electroplating also in a way okay but when you coat something or when you coat the iron with another oxide then you are actually protecting it okay and so the iron then is not exposed okay to um to the atmosphere you already have the oxidized species there so there's no need for it to corrode anymore so the other thing would be to coat it with a layer of a less active metal okay something that will not get lose electrons so easily all right so for example copper does not lose electrons easily so that is why a lot of the pipes were made of copper because copper is a lot more resistant whereas iron would corrode so you don't have iron pipes you prefer to have copper pipes so those kind of things okay you can do tin is also very resistant to um, oxidation galvanization is a particular term that is given to zinc plating okay so where you actually coat with zinc oxide and that also protects the metal so there are a lot of things that you can do to prevent corrosion and again this is all part of electrochemistry this is all part of learning how electrons move around and what is your cathode what's your anode and all that good stuff okay so yeah lots and lots to learn I, this is just like the the tip of the iceberg kind of a thing so here are the key concepts for you are just learning about the batteries, electrolysis, and corrosions. Um, I can ask you some very general questions about this, but nothing very specific. I can ask you to give me some examples of how you can use electrolysis or, excuse me, electrochemistry in your life. But um, don't worry about memorizing the equations. It's really not worth it at this point.